Good afternoon and welcome to the keynote portion of our Advancing Patient-Centered Cancer Care Summit. As we've already heard today, there is a deep need to improve the way that cancer care is delivered and that patients are centered throughout their care journeys. With us today to underscore the importance of patient-centeredness and illuminate its connection to health equity, medical practice, and policy is Dr. Wayne A. I. Frederick, the president of Howard University. In addition to serving as president of the university, Dr. Frederick is also the distinguished Charles R. Drew Professor of Surgery. Dr. Frederick has advanced Howard University's commitment to student opportunity, academic innovation, public service, and fiscal stability. He has also overseen a series of reform efforts across the university to support students, faculty, and staff. Dr. Frederick received his BS and MD from Howard University and held postdoctoral research and surgical oncology fellowships at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center before beginning his academic career as Associate Director of the Cancer Center at University of Connecticut. He is a widely recognized expert on disparities in healthcare and medical education, and his medical research focuses on narrowing racial, ethnic, and gender disparities in cancer care outcomes, especially pertaining to gastrointestinal cancers. We're so grateful to have Dr. Frederick here with us today to share his insights and expertise. Dr. Frederick, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. So it was a pleasure to join you. Wonderful to have you here. So, and I'd like to begin by asking you a question. You know, um, health disparities, health equity has been receiving a lot of attention this year, certainly um, as a as a result of the COVID pandemic and the the, the clear racial inequities in this country. What uh, what has your research shown about disparities in cancer care? And what are we learning about whether or not COVID-19 and the after effects of the pandemic have exacerbated these inequities, particularly as it comes to cancer care? Yeah, you know, um, very important uh, issue. What we've learned so far is that uh, the, the disparities are wide. Um, you look right here in DC as, as an example, you just look at life expectancy overall. A white woman in DC who lives in Ward 3 has the largest life expectancy, but almost 20 years less for a black man living in Ward 8. And think of how small DC is, just 600,000 citizens. You would think that access, et cetera, wouldn't be an issue. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated that, in my opinion. Um, I can tell you anecdotally, um, I'm seeing patients with more advanced disease. Uh, this coming Saturday morning, I'll be operating on a patient with a pancreatic tumor. And unfortunately, um, she waited a while because of the hesitation to go to the hospital, which we rightly shut down during the pandemic. But the residual impact of that is that people were still apprehensive to come out um, even after vaccinations and so on. And so I think we're gonna see a lot of missed screenings that has been documented already. I believe screenings in underrepresented minorities for some cancers were down as much as 80%. Uh, so you think already that people that weren't accessing uh, screenings and now uh, they did it even less. So they're gonna present with more advanced cancers. And I think that that's gonna be problematic. And we'll start seeing that impacting life expectancy rates probably within the next two to five years after we made lots of progress over the past two decades. So is there anything that can be done right now um, to sort of stem the tide? I mean, you, you know, obviously there's um, to do about the pandemic to sort of make that make that um, go away a little faster, but, but just in terms of specifically focusing on cancer and cancer care disparities, um, are there immediate actions that could be taken to to um, to improve the situation? Yeah, there, there are lots of things that I think um, can be done. I would prioritize them uh, probably in this order. First is we need a national um, effort to get screenings back on track. So we need public service announcements uh, in the same way that we encourage people to take vaccines as our vaccination rate has increased and as COVID decreases, we need to move some of our uh, public service announcements and our public health messaging um, to encouraging people to get to screenings uh, to close that gap. Second, we need to have a focus on underrepresented minorities because of the gap 
that does exist existed before that has only widened. So we need to be out in those communities, taking the message to them. We need to look at our infrastructure. We need to look at where we have ambulatory care centers, where some of the screenings could be done. We, look, we need to look at mobile vans, where you can do mammograms, for instance, and we need to be deploying them uh, where you have underrepresented minorities. And the third thing is more of a longer, intermediate to longer term strategy. We have to start filling the pipeline of diverse healthcare professionals who are culturally competent and would go into some of these neighborhoods and support the work that must be done. And that work must be done immediately. So if we start doing focusing on that now, um, we should be able to improve the number of healthcare providers who are willing to work in those neighborhoods, come from the, those neighborhoods, and um, are able to reach those patients within the next five to seven years. That's an intermediary step, but can go a long way in having an impact some for decades beyond. Thank you, thank you so much. And and I I, I have to ask this, and, and then I'm really um we're going to talk a lot about patient centeredness and equity and how the, the they intersect. Mm -hmm. um, there has been so much conversation around um, you know both access, you know um, structural access challenges um, as a result of the pandemic, and then trust in the medical system or lack lack of trust that is um, uh, sort of has been earned by the medical system, unfortunately. And you you know you talk about um, um, really getting the message that people need to kind of come in for their screenings or um, the, the screenings need to come to them. Are there some, are there any lessons that we've learned over the last couple of years about um, enhancing or building um, trust in the system, um, you know, among people who sort of rightfully have, have, have um, distrusted the system? Well, the pandemic has taught us a couple of things. One is that there is a general misunderstanding in our society about where that mistrust and distrust comes from. Mm -hmm. um, I think during the pandemic, uh, if you did a survey, if you went out on the street and you, you, you were asking the average person to tell you what happened in the Tuskegee experiment, I think one of the things that we learned um, is that that Tuskegee tragedy is misunderstood. Um, people do not necessarily see it as a withdrawal of, uh, or, or withhold, withholding of treatment, um, et cetera. People aren't quite sure who participated in it what was the extent and as a result they don't understand what safety measures are in place now to prevent it from ever happening again and so it's almost we, we almost need a bit of a re-education around some of these issues and a willingness to talk openly about it pushing it aside is not going to make people's distrust go away diminishing it is not going to make people's distrust go away what we need to do is to say yes this happened um it is unacceptable that it was able to happen and we've put things in place for it to never happen again. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the second thing is we have to believe in our trusted messengers. And we know that our trusted messengers do not only exist in our healthcare systems, but they exist in our churches. They exist in, in our homes, in our community centers. They exist in our corner stores and groceries. And so we have to go into the community more and partner with trusted messengers. Because when we had to get word out about the vaccinations, it was those trusted messengers who showed up um, who were able to convince um, their neighbors and their brothers and sisters and their parents mm -hmm. uh, more so than physicians. Um, trusted messengers were important. At Howard University, we were able to go into the community and do testing. We were able to go into the community and give vaccines. We were able to go into the community and convince people uh, to talk to other people and to come to us and be vaccinated. So we had a tremendous amount of success with overcoming vaccine hesita hesitancy um, early on. But what it also involved was talking to people, meeting them where they are, not avoiding their questions, but really offering ourselves up um, for that. And I think that's what we have to continue to do. My women's volleyball team was about 50% vaccinated at one point. And so they wanted to meet with me. And so I got on the Zoom call and they had some very, very good questions because here are 17 to 21 year olds um, who were being asked to take a vaccine with messenger RNA. And one of them posed a question, um, is this vaccine gonna get incorporated into my D DNA and affect my fertility? It's a great question. It gave me an opportunity to explain what messenger RNA was versus what DNA is. And then to also talk about how it works so that they can understand why it wasn't incorporated. 
And so I think the ability to do that was helpful. The team is now 100% vaccinated. I won't say it's strictly because of my conversation, mm -hmm. but I got some feedback from them that just taking the time, the willingness to explain what seems like a very complicated scientific issue um, in a layman's to from somebody that, you know, hopefully they have developed some relationship with over time and trust was meaningful. And so I, I do think that that's something that we have to continue mm -hmm. to do to change our perspective about the medical community. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that example, because I think it's such a great example of, uh, in some ways, kind of the burden that we place on people and patients to understand really complicated, complex topics, mm -hmm. uh, to make compli complicated, complex decisions, and to navigate a really complicated system. Yeah. And in that vein, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on why do you think patient-centeredness is such an important concept? Um, do you think it's such an important concept? And do you think it is in and of itself a tool that can be used to reduce health disparities? You know, my mentor, uh, Dr. LaSalle LaFall, um, who passed away a couple of years ago, had a mm -hmm. saying that the patient uh, is the object of our affection and should be the object of our obsession. And I think if you look at our healthcare system, the center of our healthcare system for too long has been the physician. And getting back to putting the patient at the center of our healthcare system is important. Now, that is not patient-centeredness uh, completely, but just the fact that if we look at the whole ecosystem around the patient, the pharmacist, the physician, the nurse, um, the occupational therapist, and we all are working like spokes on a wheel with the patient at the center. That's where it begins. That empowers the patient. It reminds the patient that we are there for them and not for ourselves. It reminds the patient that no question is an unnecessary question. Every question and concern um, that we are here to help them and empowering that patient to be able to take control of their destiny around their healthcare, mm -hmm. I think is critical in decreasing um, disparities and bringing health equity, but also in increasing the, in the, I would say the quality of the relationship with the, with the medical establishment, because it means that we have to come with some humility about what we do, the role that we play and the ultimate impact that we can have. Yeah, thank you. And and patient centeredness, in some ways, the way you describe it is so individual. It's really about answering the individual's questions, making sure that their concerns are addressed, really building building their trust one on one. And then when it comes to um, both patient centeredness and health equity, there's some real structural issues, the systemic issues. How how do you view that in your role as a leader? What are some of the structural challenges that would need to be addressed to make it possible for cancer care to be more patient-centered? Yeah, it's a great question, you know, and, and um, it's also that kind of $64,000 question, right? Mm -hmm. But I, what I do think is we need more collaboration. Um, we are training physicians here at Howard to recognize that healthcare is not only about what they provide, right? So in my case, I'm a cancer surgeon. Uh, I'm going to do a pancreatic operation this weekend. So it's not only about me knowing the anatomy, um, doing a technically good operation. That's probably the most minor part of that patient's care. What we're beginning to realize is that the social environment that patient is in. So I've met with that patient, her husband, her brother, her sister, um, at every meeting that I've met that patient, right? Her sister lives out of town. She's been on FaceTime. So I recognize even just the ecosystem around her in terms of how I view the patient support system, what can potentially happen post-operatively, et cetera. And I think that's what we have to look at. You talk about nutrition. This was a patient that was losing weight, but then I also have to take into consideration where do you shop for groceries, right? Not just what do you eat, but where do you shop? Um, do you have options that are close by? Um, in the past, have those options been good? Do you have to go travel a larger distance? So that when you start looking at those things holistically, it means that to build a system, especially around communities, we need to be sitting with legislators as physicians. We need to be sitting with community organizers as physicians. We need to be sitting with city planners 
as physicians. We need to have a seat at the table to advocate for the things that are necessary. And right now that does not happen. And when was the last time a city planner knocked on the door of the president of a university that has a medical system and said, listen, now, you know, we want to do some things in this neighborhood, but, you know, we'd like to get your input, right? Um, we, we, we are concerned about kids crossing the street and car accidents. We can say, you know, we consider about pollution and we want to, you know, and that's, so that's not happening right now in our society, but we can't just point fingers. We need to participate. We need to show up um, as good community citizens and participate. And that's what we've been trying to do at Howard. We've been trying to make the argument that uh, we need a seat at the table as well because we want a holistic system. Thank you so much. And th that's a perfect lead in. So when you have that seat at the table, what do you see as the best opportunities in the policy environment to improve patient centeredness in cancer care, uh, as well as post-cancer care? And uh, what is it that you wish um, a policy audience would take away from this conversation today? Yeah, that, that, and you know, another great question. I think one of the things that we have to look at is what are we providing for people where they are? Sometimes we look and we say, for instance, in DC, you, you've got three academic medical uh, centers, as it were. And so we say, man, for a population of 600,000 people, you've got a lot of people. But when you look in Ward 7 and 8, nobody has a presence there of magnitude, right? So right there, you have a, you have a desert, a healthy mm -hmm. desert. So that's an example where you get a seat at the table. You have to say, listen, how can we fix this? You know, what do we do? But in that same place, you also only have two groceries serving 180,000 people, mm. right? You have far more corner stores. Right? So our clinical nutrition science students, for instance, are in those corner stores talking to the proprietors about shelving. Where do you put certain items? You know, um, what are you thinking about uh, in terms of the health? You know, we, we don't want to hurt your bottom line, but your bottom line could still be great while you do provide a service to the community. And so when we, when we sit at the table, you know, that's what we're hoping to do, to, to let people see that it's an interrelated system and that uh, we all recognize again that if, if we are concerned about putting the patient at the center and we're very serious about prevention rather than cure, mm -hmm. um, then we should be acting um, appropriately. So even as a cancer surgeon, I want to put myself out of business, right? I, I want people to not have to come see me and therefore I have to be working on the prevention side as well. Thank you. So what I'm hearing really strongly coming out of this conversation with you is if we want to make cancer care more patient-centered, reduce health disparities, and really reduce cancer disparities, we have to focus on the the environment in which people live, some what some people sometimes people call the social determinants of health, that that medical providers in the medical profession need to have an expanded role within that. And that, by the way, you're sitting right here. You need the city planners to come to you. You need the private sector to come to you. So when they're making investments in these communities, they're not. It's not just about the one grocery store. It's really this broader ecosystem that is right. that is being impacted. And what I'm hearing from you is that's going to make your job as a cancer surgeon uh, easier in a way because you'll have more resources to 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 um, sort of offer the the patient, their family, their ecosystem, but also you know, at some point, right, this is also about improving health outcomes. Did I sum that up? Yeah, I think, I think you summed it up beautifully because you know, ultimately, th think, of, think of this statistic. What, what distance does the average citizen have to travel to get a mammogram? Just think of mm -hmm. if, if in the public health sector we had data like that. How far does uh, a, a patient have to go to get a colonoscopy? on average, right? And you, you just use that, that's from a transportation planning point of view. And you start looking at things like that. I think all of those things start contributing in a very different way uh, to better outcomes. Very much so. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Frederick. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have right now, but we are about to hear a policy panel that is going to further illuminate some of these questions. You've been really generous with your time and insights. Best of luck to you, uh, and thank you so, so much for joining us today at this Advancing Patient-Centered Cancer Care Summit. And thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.